Hello everybody, today we're going to be going over rheumatoid arthritis. Now what exactly is rheumatoid arthritis? This is actually a chronic inflammatory autoimmune. That is very important. It is autoimmune disease of the synovium, of the synovium. So what exactly is the synovium of the joints? Well. On the board, on the left hand side, I've actually drawn out what a normal joint looks like. This will be bone with the marrow. So that is the bone. And as you can see, this is a joint. And in, in the joint, remember the way our bodies are made, you don't want joints to be bone on bone. That is bad. That is arthritis. Not rheumatoid arthritis, just regular arthritis. We're going to talk about that in a different lecture. However, we have this nice cushion between our bones known as cartilage. That's what I drew out in blue. That is the cartilage. And the cartilage is surrounded by a synovial membrane. The green, this little green membrane is called the synovial membrane. And around that is the joint capsule. It's the capsule that basically holds our joint into place, kind of stabilizes it. So in a normal person, you can actually see that the capsule is intact with this intact synovial membrane and also in between the joints is the synovial fluid. So synovial fluid is always found in between your joints to kind of reduce the amount of friction. Now I want you to notice a difference between a normal joint and a rheumatoid arthritis joint. In a patient that has rheumatoid arthritis which we're going to talk about the pathogenesis, I want you to notice the difference. It's always the cartilage, the cartilage erosion and the bone is always eroded. And also the synovium, the synovial fluid is always affected. That is why I said it's a chronic inflammatory, it's a lot of inflammation. And it's an autoimmune disease. Antibodies, they never go away. Of the what? Synovium of the joints. Now, what's the cause of rheumatoid arthritis? We don't really know. But there's different hypotheses. There's an hypothesis that patients that develop rheumatoid arthritis, they're predisposed to foreign bodies. Foreign bodies like what? Well, it could be viruses or bacteria that actually initiate the cascade of autoimmune reaction that cause predispose them to develop rheumatoid arthritis. What is the normal age of onset? They're usually women in their 20s and up to the 40 years old. We want to keep that in mind. So let's talk about the pathogenesis. What is the pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis? Well, let's take a look. I said it was due to what? A foreign body. We don't know what kind of foreign body it is. However, we know for sure that you have a genetic predisposition. What does that mean? That means if your grandmother had it and your mother had it, most likely the daughter is going to have it too. So it can be passed from generations to generations. There's a very clear predisposition genetically from patients that their relatives has the disease. So let's go over the pathogenesis. We're saying it's a foreign body, it could be virus or bacteria. We don't know what kind of bacteria, we don't, when we don't know what kind of virus it is. However, these viruses usually are activating the CD4 helper T cells. The, the helper T cells. And these CD4 helper T cells, they can also they activate B cells, which now are converted into plasma cells. 
Now, what do plasma cells do? Well, that's basic immunology. They crank up a lot of antibodies. But in this case, the antibodies they're cranking out are IgMs. IgMs, immunoglobulin M. What does this IgM uh, proteins do? They go and attack and attach to the FC region. That's the FC region of a self antibody, which is an IgG. Really? We got two antibodies attacking each other? That's correct. We've got IgM attacking the FC region. Can you imagine walking on the street and somebody just humps on your back? That, that's right. That's what an IgM does when it humps on the IgG's back. That complex, the IgM binded to the FC region of the IgG is known as the rheumatoid factor. Keep that at the back of your mind because it's very important. I'm going to talk about rheumatoid factor when we get to the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. But this is where it comes from. So when we say rheumatoid factor, it's IgM on top of an IgG. Well, what do these guys do? They cause release of cytokines. They now deposit in the cartilage, causing inflammation. That's why I drew the arrow. I see how the arrow is going up. It's causing inflammation and the inflammation is inflaming what the cartilage the synovium and destroying the bone because that's what inflammation does so the CD4 cells are causing inflammation and also the rheumatoid factor immune complex are causing destruction of the tissue this by the way is attacking the cartilage proteins the protein inside your cartilage does destroying them so you're developing a chronic inflammatory synovitis chronic inflammatory synovitis let's draw that somewhere here and that's what I'm trying to depict here in the picture now what do you always notice in the joints of patients that have rheumatoid arthritis after this chronic destruction is the panis formation. Remember that word. That's a very important word. Panis formation. And that is the destruction of the cartilage. And you see how it's kind of malformed? Yeah, that's what I was trying to depict. And the bone has been eroded and destroyed. And that's why we have that edgy, fuzzy looking uh, bone a matrix because it's been destroyed and damaged so what do we notice that's very key to rheumatoid arthritis you have increased synovial fluid in the joint space because of the chronic inflammation that's going on now rheumatoid arthritis disease has a spectrum it can go from mild to moderate to severe rheumatoid arthritis you want to keep that at the back of your mind because based on the severity of the disease, it really limits the patient's ability to function. What do I mean by that? Well, patient, you have to wake up in the morning, go take a shower. Well, if your joints are very, very stiff and they're hurt and they're very painful, that will limit your ability to function and go to work and do the things you normally do. So this is why the disease severity uh, it has a wide spectrum. And it's also important that this, you can actually get so severe that you can wheel bound and wheel bound to the chair the, uh, to the wheelchair and this is actually the most severe form of rheumatoid arthritis let's go over the clinical features of rheumatoid arthritis so what do patients with rheumatoid arthritis present with clinically well the first thing I want you to know is that this is a symmetric symmetrical inflammatory arthritis but that is very very important the symmetrical means both joints are affected at the same time and this, and this affects all joints in the body except the DIP DIP stands for the distal interphalangeal joint so if you look at your finger you have this joint right here as you can see that is the MCP 
the metacarpal phalangeal joint is between your metacarpals with the, the joints that are buried in here I mean the bones the metacarpals and they attach to your phalanges your phalanx so MCP and then the next joint which is proximal is called PIP proximal interphalangeal joint stands for PIP and the last but not the least is DIP which is the distal interphalangeal joint rheumatoid arthritis does not touch the DIP however the most common joints is the PIP uh, proximal interphalangeal joint and the metacarpal phalangeal joint which is the MCP gosh how do I remember this I'll tell you in a minute but it also affects the wrist affects your ankles it can affect your knees it can affect your hips the shoulders so keep that at the back of your mind but the two key ones you have to remember when it comes to the hands is the MCP and PIP well my mnemonic stands for PM since PIP and MCP stands for PM these patients are gonna have joint pain they have a lot of inflammation so they're gonna have a lot of joint pain and this joint pain when they wake up in the morning is gonna hurt well morning stiffness morning stiffness and the way you remember it always remember PM PM alright morning stiffness these patients are gonna wake up with a lot of severe joint pain when they wake up in the morning and it's always the P and the M is always affected they can also have some low-grade fever low-grade fever weight loss and if they have fatigue that is telling you they probably at that point have a systemic systemic um, effect because rheumatoid arthritis actually affect multiple organs which we're gonna go over what are you gonna see what is very classic of rheumatoid arthritis is the hand deformities remember we said is the PM the proxima and the metacarpal phalange joint well one of the very common one is ulnar deviations I'm gonna show you what an ulnar deviation is they're gonna have their hands that it look like that and their MCP because it's affected and their PIP is affected and the degeneration, degeneration of the joint over a long period of time and also their wrist is also affected eventually it's going to cause the patient's hand to look like that and that is ulnar deviation all the fingers actually are pointed to the ulnar side another hand deformity is boutonnieres boutonnieres disease well boutonnieres deformity affects the PIP right but what you see with boutonnieres is I'm going to demonstrate it for you do you see how the PIP is flexed and the DIP is hyperextended it literally looks like this that is boutonnieres deformity see how my proximal interphalangeal joint is really flexed at that joint and my distal interphalangeal joint is actually extended hyper extended that is boutonnieres the second one or the last but not the least is the swan neck deformity swan neck deformity also known as the z thumb is the z thumb well in swan neck contractures what do we see well we're gonna notice that the patient's mcp is flexed so this your mcp is actually flexed and the dip and the, the P the 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 proximal interphalangeal joint is hyperextended. However, however, the DIP is actually flexed. So I don't know if you can see this. See how I had my distal the DIP is flexed, my MCP is flexed, however, my PIP is hyperextended. That's what I was trying to show you on the board here. A flex PIP a flex DIP but a hyperextended PIP that is known as a swan neck deformity well those are the hand deformities that's very classic with rheumatoid arthritis but this is also very important 
these patients you gotta watch out for their cervical spine because rheumatoid arthritis affects the cervical spine especially C1 and C2 why is this important cervical spine C1 C2 Rheumatoid arthritis affects C1 and C2 because they can have subluxation or instability of the atlas and the axis on top of each other. Now, if you have degeneration of your C1 and C2, that is basically what's holding up your neck. But wait a minute, let's look at our neck. If this is the skull, right, and at the base of the skull, that's a foramen magnum, right? And we have the dense, and then we have the atlas and the axis, right? The axis and the atlas. But out of the brain, out of the skull, it's your brain is coming out, right? The brain is actually sitting inside the skull and coming out of the foramen magnum is the spinal cord. Ha! Ah. So because these patients can develop subluxation of the C1 and C2 joint, this patient can be actually life-threatening. So if the patient has to go for surgery, you have to make sure you do an x-ray of the cervical spine. Because if you don't do that, and you try to intubate this patient. When we intubate a patient, you actually have to hyperextend their neck a little bit and basically put the tube down into their trachea. The problem is if you try to do that and they have subluxation, you can herniate their brain and these patients can die. So this is very, very important. So whenever they go into surgery, Always do cervical spine radiographs. Always shoot an x-ray, make sure they're fine and clear, and then you can send them to surgery. Now let's go over the other parts of the body, different organ system that's actually affected also by rheumatoid arthritis. What other part of the body does rheumatoid arthritis actually affect? Let's take a look. Let's start with the skin. Now this patient's have the classic rheumatoid nodules rheumatoid nodules on their skin their subcutaneous right under the skin and these nodules can be found either in the elbows or they can be found in the occiput occiput in the elbows or at the sacrum and this is pathognomonic for rheumatoid arthritis you see that you got it you know they have rheumatoid arthritis those are nodules that's very classic well what about their skin well their skin is very very thin they're very atrophic so they can tend to bruise easily this skin tend to break and this bruise easily that's another uh, manifestation of rheumatoid arthritis in these patients well also because they develop vasculitis, damage inflammation to their blood vessels, they tend to develop ulcers, ulcers, let's put that in red, ulcers around their hands. And that is from poor blood flow, damage to the blood vessels, and they can develop skin ulcers. All right, and that's usually found around the fingers and the fingernails and their nail folds. So aside just from the nodules they get on their hands, they all, and also in their elbows, in the back of the occiput and sacrum, also want to watch out for ulcers. But that's body for the skin. Now let's jump into the body. Well, I'm gonna put every symptom that affect every organ system right at the center of our image. So let's look at the heart. What are the cardiac manifestations of rheumatoid arthritis? Well, the pericardium is affected. Thus, they develop pericarditis. 
inflammation of the pericardium so they can have chest pain which feel better when they feel when they lean forward and get worse when they lie on their back that's pleuritic chest pain kind of knife like right around their chest but that's from the inflammation of the pericardium remember this is a chronic autoimmune inflammatory disease and every organ system is affected they can also, because of pericarditis from the inflammation, they can have a pericardiac effusion fluid right around the heart. Also, this can also affect their conduction system in the heart, which can so they, they're predisposed to develop bundle branch blocks. Like what? They can have right bundle branch blocks, right? Where you get the rabbit hairs, right? The RSR complex. That would be like a right bundle branch block. And they can be predisposed to that from their rheumatoid arthritis. In their lungs, what do we see? Well, I've drawn out the lungs here. These patients can develop plural effusions. Now there's something unique about pleural effusions in rheumatoid arthritis. What is it? Well, it has low glucose, very low glucose. And you can watch our lecture on pleural effusions to be able to hear more details. But they develop pleural effusions and they can also have pleuritis just as they can develop inflammation of around their heart, right? They're around the pericardium that surrounds their heart. They can develop inflammation around the pleura that actually wraps around the lungs. So they can develop pleuritis. Also, these patients can have nodules, pulmonary nodules in their lungs. They can even have nodules in their heart, nodules of the skin. These nodules can actually be found in their heart and also in their lungs, in the pleura. Also, they are predisposed to developing pulmonary fibrosis, which is an interstitial lung disease. And they also, if they develop pulmonary fibrosis, what kind of pattern are we going to see when we do a pulmonary function test? It will be a restrictive pattern because the lungs is a little shrunk down from the fibrosis the parenchyma of the lungs has been affected from the chronic inflammation you can also find infiltrates on the chest x-ray but for the most part pulmonary fibrosis is what they're going to develop and on the chest x-ray what do we see honeycomb the honey honeycomb pattern it's what we see on chest x-ray that's pretty much it for the pulmonary system. Let's go to the eyes. What does this patient present with when they develop eye problems? Well, the sclera is affected, thus they can develop scleritis. Scleritis, inflammation of the white part of your eyes, which is the sclera, and that can cause a lot of eye pain. Also, there's another syndrome they develop called scleromalacia. What is that? Sclero, from the word sclero, malacia always means soft. Remember, osteomalacia means soft bones. Scleromalacia means the soft sclera. Well, if the sclera is very soft and you don't treat this, they can actually perforate. They can perforate their sclera and they can go blind. So this is very, very serious condition and you don't want the patient to go blind. They also can develop dry eyes, a lot of dryness around their eyes and because of, and also dry mucous membrane. If they're having dry eyes, what is coming to your mind? Ah, let me think. Sjogren syndrome. Sjogren syndrome. Why? Can you imagine that? Well, these patients have an increased risk of developing Sjogren syndrome because remember when we talked about ANA, ANA levels is part of the whole spectrum. Rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, mixed connective tissue disease. Well, these patients can also predispose to develop Sjogren's syndrome. And that's pretty much what happens when their eyes are affected. 
Let's go over what's going to happen to the nervous system. The nervous system is very important. What usually happens is they develop mononeuritis multiplex. Mono means one. Neuritis means one nerve. Multiplex. And what is this? This is actually an infarction of the nerve trunk. Infarction of the nerve trunk. And what happens with the infarction nerve trunk? Well, the patients cannot move their arm, they can't move their leg, and also they have systemic uh, vasculitis. And pretty much at this point, you know this is a bad sign. This is a bad sign. You don't want patients to reach this stage where they actually develop this multiplex of different nerve root trunks that has been infarcted. And when we see the central nervous system, we know the spinal cord, right, and the brain. Also, these patients have an effect. The disease has an effect on their blood vessels. Well, what is that? That is vasculitis. They can develop vasculitis. This we call microvascular vasculitis, which can progress to mesenteric vasculitis. That's another thing you need to keep at the back of your mind with these patients. If blood vessels are affected, and since they're small blood vessels, we call them microvascular vasculitis. All right? So, there's one more syndrome that's very classic with rheumatoid arthritis, and this is known as Felty syndrome. Felty syndrome. Well, what is Felter syndrome? Felter syndrome is three different pathologies combined together, which is neutropenia. Patients also have rheumatoid arthritis and splenomegaly. So this triad of patients that has a huge spleen, and then they have rheumatoid arthritis, and you check their white blood, uh, you ch check their CBC, and you notice they're neutropenic. That basically is a classic triad known as Feltis syndrome. And how do I remember Feltis syndrome? Because Feltis syndrome went to nursing school to get his RN. Yeah. So Felti is basically the RN's manager. Where we RN rheumatoid arthritis and for neutropenia and S for splenomegaly. That's how you remember Felty syndrome. Well, why is this important? Let's check this out. If you have neutropenia, if you don't have neutrophils, you can't mount an immune response. So thus, these patients are very susceptible to infections, infections, all right? And also, they have a lot of extra articular disease, which means their heart is affected, their lungs can be affected, their eyes, they can have all these different parts of their body being affected also, especially also the spleen. The spleen is affected. And because not just they are just neutropenic, these patients can also have anemia, they can have low uh, platelets, which is thrombocytopenia, and lymphadenopathy. So just looking at the blood line, blood cells, they can have low platelets, which is the fancy name for thrombocytopenia, low lymphocytes, I'm sorry, lymphoadenopathy, I take that back, actually swollen lymph nodes, lymphoadenopathy, and they can have anemia, anemia, all right? So that is Felty syndrome. Remember Felty is the RNs. If the blood cells are affected, they can also develop anemia of chronic disease. It could be normocytic or normocytic anemia. And that's pretty much all the organ system that is affected when you have rheumatoid arthritis. Now, let's figure out how do we make the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis.
How do we make the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis? You want to first order some labs. You want to check for the rheumatoid factor titer. Remember rheumatoid factor is that IgM attacking the FC region of an IgG, which is a self-IgG in your body. That complex we can measure in the blood. In patients with rheumatoid arthritis, 80% of patients that actually have rheumatoid arthritis, we have a high rheumatoid factor level. But I have to tell you, this test is non-specific because a small segment of people, normal healthy people, also have high rheumatoid factors. They're high, but they're normal, they're fine. So this is a non-specific test, but if you do have rheumatoid arthritis, you're still going to have high levels of rheumatoid factor. The next test is ESR and CRP, erythrocyte sedimentation rate or C-reactive protein levels. These are markers of inflammation. That's all they do. It just tells us, hey, guess what? Somewhere in your body, there's some kind of inflammation going on. Where? Oh, I don't know, but the bottom line is that's what they're for, but they're going to be very, very high, so that's another test we can order. And this patient is going to have anemia of chronic disease, anemia of chronic disease, which is going to show a normal cytic, normal chromic anemia. Now, after we order the labs, we want to check a radiograph using an x-ray. When an x-ray, we're going to be looking at the joints, we're looking at the fingers. Where in the fingers, what are we going to see? Bone loss at the finger joints, bone loss. See how the bone has been eroded right around there? Yeah, that is classic. And also, the cartilage has been eroded, destroyed by the immune reaction and inflammation. So if I take out the cartilage between your joints, what happens? Ah, you get narrowing of the joint space. That's why we develop narrowing of the joint space. So again, the cartilage and the bone is eroded. It's worth mentioning that this is completely different from osteoarthritis, where you actually develop osteophytes. No, you don't develop osteophytes. You develop panis. A panis formation is what you develop from the chronic inflammatory response around the joint. Bone erosions, bone loss of the finger joints, and joint space narrowing a pathognomonic for rheumatoid arthritis. And also you're going to see a lot of synovial fluid in the joint space. And it's a lot of inflammatory cells inside that synovium. The last test we can order is a synovial fluid analysis. Synovial fluid analysis. But I have to tell you this is actually also non-specific. Because that's where the damage is going on, we can go in there with a needle, suck out the fluid, and analyze it. When we analyze it, you're going to get a very cloudy yellow, cloudy yellow fluid, and you're going to have white blood cells inside. And usually the white blood cell count, when you have infl inflammation, is usually greater than 5,000 uh, per millimeter cube of white blood cells inside the, uh, inside the synovial fluid. But remember, this is non-specific because all the inflammatory arthropathies like gout, pseudogout, also can have the same synovial fluid analysis. However, there's other things that's going to show up uh, on that to actually distinguish if you have gout or pseudogout, but that's why it's very non-specific. Well, once we're able to gather all this data, this can give us an idea what the patient has. And the patient probably has rheumatoid arthritis. Now, let's find out how we're going to treat this patient. How do we treat patients with rheumatoid arthritis? It's very important that you know that every patient is different. And there's different treatment modalities that works for one person. Doesn't mean it's going to work for another person. But your goal in treatment is to slow down or decrease or prevent joint destruction. That's the ultimate goal. And to also keep these patients in remission. 
At the same time, we also want to watch out for the toxicity of the medications we're going to be giving them because some of this medication are actually toxic and have severe side effects. So, whereas the first thing we want to do, we want to tell the patient to exercise. The exercise helps strengthen the bones and the muscles and give the patient more mobility. Also, pain control. Where's the first drug you want to give for pain and control? And said non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. That's to control the pain and it also can help with the inflammation. If that doesn't help, we can go to low dose corticosteroids. You don't want to put them on long-term steroids. You want to put them on short low dose, short-term low dose corticosteroids. And you don't want to give them high dose steroids either. Well, once we exhaust this step, the other drugs that we give are called DMARDs, disease modifying anti -rheumatoid, uh, rheumatoid arthritis drugs. Now, these medications, they are really good at reducing the morbidity and mortality of the patient, thus slowing the progression of the disease. So they really, really work and preserve their joint function. So where's the first line drug? Methotrexate. Methotrexate is a first line drug for therapy. And the thing is, these drugs takes about six weeks for them to work. So it takes a while before the drugs actually start working, but once they start, they really help decrease and slow down the progression of the disease. However, methotrexate, as great as it is, it has significant side effects. What are side effects? We have can develop GI upset or GI ulcers. So adverse drug reactions, ADRs. GI upset or ulcers. You can also develop alopecia. It's also a bone marrow suppressant. It also can cause hepatotoxicity. So it can be toxic to the liver, GI, liver damage, and also can cause bone marrow suppression. Also it can cause interstitial pneumonitis which can predispose you to develop pulmonary fibrosis. So those have significant side effects of um, methotrexate. So because it affects the liver, you always want to keep an eye on their renal function and also check on their liver function. So you want to order LFTs and also check the renal function to make sure they don't have any severe toxicity from the medication. If methotrexate doesn't work, then the alternative is hydroxychloroquine, which is an anti-malaria drug, and that's an alternative, but one of the side effects of hydroxychloroquine is because it can cause visual loss and cause due to its effect on the eyes causing retinopathy retinopathy. So you always want to do an eye exam every six months to prevent vision loss. That's an alternative. And another drug is sulfur salazine. Sulfur salazine. And these are all the first line medications for rheumatoid arthritis. Now the second line is gold is a thioprine, penicillamine, or cyclosporine. And the mnemonic is C the gap. Yeah, that's C G A P, C gap. That's the second line drug. But the first line is methotrexate, alternative hydroxychloroquine, and hydroxy, uh, and also sulfur cells. And it's very important if somebody's on methotrexate to always make sure they're getting folate because they develop folate deficiency. So you always want to give them a folate, folic acid replacement so that you can, so these patients don't develop a uh, folate deficiency, we can have another significant side effect on causing them to develop 
may God will bless you, name you. All right, and that's pretty much it. That brings up and wraps up our story on rheumatoid arthritis. Now, the last resort is surgery for this patient, and at that point, you have to do a synovectomy. A synovectomy. And that is the last resort using surgery, which is very rare. Actually go in there and actually resect out the synovium uh, to actually help the patient feel much better. Um, and also they can have a joint replacement surgery to actually replace the joint. But that is the last resort when these medications actually fail completely. All right. So just in summary, rheumatoid arthritis is what? It's an autoimmune disease, right? We don't know what causes it. Found in young females, 20 to 40 years old. Very common symptoms, morning stiffness, joint pain, which feels better as the day goes along. So when, as, the, as the day is moving on, they're like, oh, my joints feel much better, but they're always stiff when they wake up. They can have some fever, weight loss, some fatigue, and they can have extra articular manifestations which is affecting their heart. They can have lung problems, heart problems, GI problems, um, nervous system problems, and they have nodules in the skin. And remember, rheumatoid factor is the, what, what you want to order for tighter level, check for CRP, you want to check also for um, ESR, and which is just a sign of inflammation, do an x-ray, and make your diagnosis. Start off with exercise, pain control, steroids, and give them DMARDs to help the patient feel better. All right. Thank you very much for watching. Till I see you again, it's Adela here from Future Teaching Physicians. Have a great day. Bye-bye.